Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to our second keynote session. My name is Molly Gower. I teach here in the Department of Religious Studies at St. Mary's College, and it's been my great pleasure to serve as a member of the conference planning team. We had a lot of fun. It was important to the conference planning team that we hear from women who serve the church. With last night's conversation ringing in my ears, maybe I'll say instead, women who are the church <laughs> in a variety of ways. And we dreamed of having a leading theologian of our time who could guide our conference conversations together. I am delighted that Cecilia Gonzalez Andreu has accepted our invitation to be here with us and to offer God talk that is in relationship to her work as a teacher, scholar, and activist. Cecilia speaks and marches with those who thirst for the liberative spirit of theological thought. Her scholarly writings explore theological aesthetics, educational justice and access, Latinx theology, and the theology of Pope Francis. She also writes on immigration, education, and our current political concerns as a contributor for America Magazine. She is the author of Bridge to Wonder, Art as a Gospel of Beauty, and co-editor of Teaching Global Theologies, Power and Praxis. At Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, Cecilia leads the university's work on issues of worker justice and with undocumented service. On a personal note, witnessing Cecilia's work with vulnerable students at LMU from a door or two down the hallway when she and I, when I was so fortunate to be her colleague for a couple of years, was transformative for me. She is a member of the board of the Ignatian Solidarity Network, and she co-chairs LMU's Latino Theology and Ministry Initiative. Please join me in welcoming Cecilia Gonzalez Andreu as she delivers her keynote address, hashtag mine too, why robust women's voices are indispensable to the church. Let's welcome her and let's use her hashtag. Thank you so much. First, how do I thank this team, this committee, Arlene? My goodness, you, you have put together an extraordinary conference and I know I am very grateful for you. And how do I tell you about the joy of having so many amazing women that I know and respect gathered in one spot? <laughs> this is just beautiful. I've got my former students, Claudia and Krista, are here. I have my faculty colleagues from LMU, Kim and Leila, with me. I have my sister theologians, Natalia and Vanessa, with me. I have my colleagues from Ignatian Solidarity Network, Betty Ann and Andrea, with me. I have my amazing editor at America, <laughs> Carrie Weber, with me. And our colleague, Heidi Schlumpf. I mean, what a group. You know, this is amazing. So I hope that you really, really take in what it is for all of us because as you can see all of these women are people I love trust work with all the time and who support me and I support them and that's what we women do so I have to say a special thank you now to my husband Jean-Paul who is sitting here and will be changing the slides so if, if anything goes wrong, <laughs> it was my fault, okay? So let's begin. You know, I don't like using the phrase, a perfect storm, 
to describe that moment when things are blowing up simultaneously in multiple contexts and places. There can be beautiful perfection in a storm. It's a natural wonder, and a really perfect storm should enthrall us with its display of the power of nature. A storm is an evocative image for faith. As Christ sleeps in the boat, and we know he will calm all. Storms are beautiful. So let's get rid of that metaphor. Now lately, pop culture has come up with more colorful language to describe such massive experiences of everything breaking down at once, like dumpster fire. <laughs> However, I also don't like the metaphor of a dumpster fire because if things are in a dumpster, we have already discarded them, and what's more, we want someone to take them away. They're useless things, and their destruction is already assured. The fire is incidental, and let's face it, being made of metal, dumpsters keep their fires to themselves and don't take the whole city with them. So you've probably guessed why I've begun here, looking for metaphors for what is astonishingly chaotic and destructive. The past few, few years have unleashed a series of such events directly affecting the community of communities we call our Catholic Church. Is it a perfect storm? Is it a dumpster fire? How do we begin to deal with what is happening? Now within our Catholic community, the calamitous has been unleashed not only personally, not only locally, not only regionally, but ultimately globally. I doubt that when our forebears used the language of Catholicity to speak of a community that had remarkably overcome the differences between peoples, languages, and continents, they could have imagined that that very same universality would also allow evil to spread like wildfire. So I am a Californiana. And since my college days, I've traveled to Yosemite at least yearly, first with friends and later carrying my infant son in a backpack with my daughter skipping happily in front. Now we travel with our adult children and we still play our games of poo sticks, dropping them in the water from our favorite old stone bridge. Yosemite is glorious and spending time there is one of our family's most beloved traditions. As John Paul said on his first visit, being there is like looking into the palms of God's hands as God holds up the world. Yet these past couple of years, we have had to cancel our family trips on multiple occasions because of wildfires followed by unrelenting snow and ice on the devastated forest that finished destroying what the fires had missed. When we finally returned, there were areas that appeared as landscapes from another planet, bare sticks pointing helplessly up, just so many ghosts of redwoods and pines, massive trees of a thousand years cracked in two like twigs. Old and well-trod trails completely washed away and piles of charred remnants strewn everywhere, peeking out from massive snow drifts. And yet, and this is a picture by my daughter, as we took a deep breath, we saw once more that Yosemite was glorious. We wept at its wounded state, but then looked up to its enormous, majestic granite cliffs bathed in golden light. We walked with care, encountering tiny new saplings and rejoicing at each one as at a new creation. We saw families like ours returning to this home we all loved, stunned and tearful but grateful 
to share our wonderment at nature's resilience and its constant giftedness. We felt humbled by it all. So I want to suggest to you that this is the best metaphor I can come up with for the current state of our universal, broken, wounded, charred, and shattered Catholic Church. So, so beloved and in such peril. We are facing the disconcerting confusion of being unable to figure out where we are because so much of what we knew is no longer standing, no longer recognizable, no longer apparently invulnerable. It is a painful moment. But in taking stock and noticing, we can also see the resilience of our shared faith with this extraordinary splendor. Ours is, after all, a faith that claims in what appears an insane idea as the ultimate beauty, one of our fellow humans, young, tortured, and bleeding, hanging on a cross to show us unequivocally what it means to love and be loved as the Christ opened up all of history to life in God. Christianity is not a religion of perfection, harmony, symmetry, or triumph. No, Christianity is the messy story of unrelenting love and generosity that is not destroyed by evil precisely because we have been reminded again and again of our vulnerability and have chosen to intentionally inhabit our brokenness. Yes, large swaths of our fellow Christians have forgotten this. They have forgotten their own persecution, precariousness, doubt, and marginality. They have clung to victory and armies, to certainty and hubris. They have enslaved others, burned saints, sought power, built empires. The church triumphant and militant is something, but it is not Christianity as Jesus lived it. Today's wholesale destruction is then a sobering opportunity to remember who we are and reclaim the splendor of vulnerable love. So now back to Yosemite. The wise caretakers there, the nat naturalists, the rangers, the experts, have begun putting in place remedies so that this glimpse of heaven on earth will survive us and our children. Where rivers overflow, the waters will remain, respectful of the natural warnings of new geographies and the remaking of maps where precarious human structures were set ablaze and destroyed by ice, no new ones will be built. The restoration of Yosemite will proceed with the humble consciousness that human making is too small to stand over and against a creation that is much greater than us. Each new sapling will be respected. Each new brook will be given its room. And ways to collaborate in humility with the granite cliffs and the fragile metals will be constantly sought. Vulnerable, humble, conscious, respectful, coming to terms with all that went wrong, each person who loves Yosemite must commit to political action on behalf of the environment to changing the systems and conditions and to listening to the land and the water as the original Awanichi people who inhabited knew how to do. But now imagine a different response. Imagine that we convince ourselves that the fires and the ice are behind us now and will not happen again. What if we just put up more structures near the rivers 
and build tall fences around them. We're going to be safe, right? And what if we just build more campgrounds with roaring campfires, but have water buckets nearby? No fires would start, right? What if we take no action at all on the environmental groaning of our planet and acquiesce to the expediency of the marketplace? And even more, what if we continue doing everything just as before in a structure that is unresponsive to the reality surrounding it? Everything will be fine, right? We've got fences and water buckets. What could possibly go wrong? I'll tell you something, the deer and bears, the trees, waterfowl, flowers, and all manner of creatures who depend on a healthy forest would have a radically different view of what must be done so they may survive and thrive in this ecosystem that has thus far been their home. Paying close attention to them leads to different outcomes. And that is what I want to suggest is our gift as women of the church. Ours is the unexpectedly clear-eyed perspective from the forest floor or from the top branches of trees. The responses to the convergence of crisis we have experienced as an institution an ecosystem do not sufficiently address structures and practices that together created the explosive mix that had slowly been building up fuel and then combusted, taking everything in its path. Theologian Gustavo Gutierrez tells us that new perspectives and theologies flourished in our world because there was an eruption of the poor into history. As we take stock of today, are we looking at an eruption of women into history? In the last decades of the 20th century, in Gutierrez's native Peru, El Salvador, Brazil, parts of Africa and Asia, the ones who have been the discarded of the world began to speak and teach the church how to be truly faithful to our tradition and our sacred scriptures and to the vision of reality God communicated there. They did this by addressing tangible realities. As we see with those who gathered to listen to the young teacher from Nazareth, the poor of the world are the ones who can see most clearly what is wrong because they are close to the ground and because they depend completely on God and each other. Can we, my dear friends, see ourselves that way in relation to the ecosystem of the church? Are we the ones who lacking access to power have a very different motivation for being part of this community, are we able to see more clearly? Is our vocation to follow the way that Jesus taught more closely aligned with his than all male clerical structures have built up power over centuries? Are we constitutive parts of the ecosystem of the Jewish and Christian forest that can lovingly restore it to love of God and love of neighbor. As someone who was brought to this country at a young age but already enthralled by the incandescent liberationist Latin American Catholic faith that I had lived, I want to suggest to you that right now, at this moment, when the mix of wildfires and snowstorms are consuming our church, the ways of the poor, the indigenous and marginal of the world, have much to teach us. We women must align ourselves with them, try to see through their eyes, 
and break into history. So I want to propose four things to you that guide the rest of this reflection. First, I want to be of service to you. I want you to be able to leave here with something in your backpack that will be useful to the particularity of your work, of dismantling what needs to be dismantled and restoring and constructing what brings us flourishing. Second, in this room and at this conference are many women whose extraordinary work supports the work of Christ in multiple ways, ways much closer to the forest floor than I am. I am humbled by you, and I ask your forgiveness if the limitations of my perspective don't allow me to see enough of the complexities you face. What I share is from my vantage point, but what we know is that through sharing multiple clear-eyed perspectives, we will get a much better map. Third, I am acutely aware that as a tenured university professor, I am able to speak of difficult things that many of you may wish to, but cannot. My own theological method requires me to listen much, and I have heard both pain and great wisdom from the women of the church my entire life. I can't imagine a more vital role for our universities than to make sure our teaching and our research nurtures access to education for those historically kept from it and that each of us takes up our responsibility of raising up voices willing to tell the truth. Finally, I am a cancer survivor, and I understand something about urgency. I also understand limitation and frailty. I want to posit to you that strength and resilience arise from our very vulnerability and make us a formidable force for the good. Let me say a little more about this. As Teresa of Avila expressed this dilemma in her autobiography, she described feeling caught between two competing impulses. On one side was her humility and powerlessness which was problematically lifted up as a womanly virtue and meant to keep her at the margins. And on the other side was her conviction that bold and sweeping reforms had to happen for the good of the church. She resolved the tension by realizing these were not opposite things. She could be, should be humble. So should every Christian. And there was freedom in that. While at the same time, she could undertake great, courageous work because, and here was her solution, it was God working through her. Whatever good she accomplished was God's, not hers. And whatever setbacks she faced were opportunities for God's wisdom to reach her and teach her. Unlike others who shut themselves off in personal piety and self-flagellation, Teresa went boldly into the world, convinced that her hard work was the very best witness she could provide of God's real presence as love. She was so fearless that in a society obsessed with overcoming sin and temptations, she claimed that she was quite sure that even the demons feared her. <laughs> that was her openness to God's work in her. So the church does not exist for itself, but for the work of God. Our strength in vulnerability is for the good of a world, stretching far beyond the confines of our own community. As a Catholic church, we have done and can continue to do great good, but we are living 
in the midst of a raging wildfire. The wildfire is not over, it's not even contained. What we do every single day matters. So these four considerations, being practical, knowing that each of our situations is different, cognizant of the role of education, and acutely aware of how vulnerable our entire world is right now, led me to decide to work with you today on what we theologians call methodology. <laughs> and mothers like me just call a plan. What I am going to present to you are five steps meant to be portable, applicable to whatever situation you find yourself in, and ready to go at a moment's notice. If we align ourselves with the poor and discarded of the world, with the small and the vulnerable, with the broken and suffering, then it is the theologies arising from these communities that form this plan. I have woven this from multiple places, responding to what I perceive may help our ecosystem. What do we women of the church do to face the breakdown in the church's structures, the loss of moral authority that makes it almost impossible for our leaders to speak up against atrocities when we are most needed? How do we critique and present alternatives to the tone-deaf clergy who think, if we just teach more doctrine, the young will come back? <laughs> How do we respond to the others urging us to turn the clock back? Bring out our fancy clothes. Close in on ourselves and refuse to engage the world's pain. What do we do about the problematic political alliances that victimize the many by following empty promises only meant to manipulate people of faith? What do we do? Our very first step in this plan is to ask why. What do I mean by this? This is not about asking why something is happening. This is about asking why I care that this particular thing is happening. This is a question that can only be answered if we stay, spend time every day listening intently to our hearts. We have to ask ourselves, why do I care about this church? Why do I care about the poor? Why do I care about immigrants, the sick, the incarcerated, the abused, the violated? Why does this actually matter to me? This is the step of discernment. Refining our vocation to do, as Ignacio de Loyola said, and see God in all things. We can't answer a call we have not received. And we cannot commit, as another Jesuit, Pedro Arrupe, told us, unless we are in love. If we skip this step, we might burn out, or become angry, or even give up. But if we take this step, we might discover that we are deeply in love with our God and with the creation our God gave us. And in this way, we will find a reason every day to get up and try again. On a retreat with students, I asked them, why are you in college? Every single one of them responded with a version of the same answer. I am here for my family. I am here for my community. Now, any of you who teach might say there's something very strange about these answers. And you would be right. In a mainstream group of college students, the answers would be about careers, economic well-being, and personal fulfillment. 
They would talk about themselves and about following their particular dreams and passions. But this was not a group of mainstream students. These were undocumented students. Every day, they had to find the strength to get up and do the same amount of work the others were doing while also caring for younger siblings, negotiating spaces and problems for their extended families, and sometimes, thanks to DACA, being the only ones who could legally work, having the future of parents, grandparents, and siblings depending on them. In a political climate that uses their lives as bargaining chips, these young people live with a level of uncertainty few of us can imagine. Yet, they can answer with conviction. We know why we're here. It's for the ones we love. Like then, each one of us needs to make ourselves vulnerable to the precarious life lived by the majority of humanity. And ask ourselves the question, why does this matter to me? When you have your answer, as my students do, it will make you unrelenting. At my university, the highest graduation rate is among undocumented students. Not only because they're so resilient, they actually named their student org Resilience, but because many of the rest of us have asked ourselves, why does this matter? and found ourselves in love with each of them, their families and community. Communally, we provide the nurturing care that helps them thrive, sharing the goal of a societal transformation that reflects God's will and where no one is ever discarded. As you answer why you care in prayer, the clarity of that answer will help you renew your commitment every day. You will find that you actually believe the stunning description of God in sacred scriptures best summarized by the first letter of John that tells us God is love. The answer to our why should always have love in it. The next three steps in our plan may sound familiar to you because there are versions of them in most, most of the pastoral ministries, but let's sharpen them. After asking ourselves why we care, we move to the second step. Theologians in the global south, especially Latin America, have developed a fine sense for speaking about this next step rooted in the experiences of the poor. I'm gonna bring together three of their insights and fuse them into one step in our plan. First is the need to see, familiar from see, judge, act. Second is the priority of accompaniment, meaning walking with, allowing the other to have their own agency by living in radical solidarity. And third is the concept of la realidad. It means the real, but in a radical way. Because paying attention to la realidad is the only way we can be attuned to what is revealed in history. So we may embody the possibility of transforming that history. The requirement to accompany la realidad is not to be done half-heartedly being attentive only to what best suits our plans. La realidad cannot be contained to what we wish to see, but it is accompanying our fellow travelers in their reality, as Jesus did on the way to Emmaus. It is an attitude of joining in with what is happening and doing so humbly and fearlessly. It was this kind of seeing la realidad because he accompanied his community that completely transformed a quiet and bookish bishop into St. Oscar Romero. 
It was this kind of immersive attentiveness that made St. Francis of Assisi give up his privilege. And St. Teresa of Avila decide that the structures of religious life were corrupt and needed reform. So our step here is to live into our bodies and to relate intimately to the bodies of others and the cries of our planet. We aim to breathe in our world's fragrances, but also the smells of its slums. As Pope Francisco says, to enter this reality, we must smell like it. The sheep. La realidad cannot be entered safely or guardedly, but wholeheartedly. And this is why we must build up our resolve from the solid foundation of love. Our third step is to imagine expansively. And I admit to just wanting to quote theologian Walter Brueggemann's new closing chapter to his classic, The Prophetic Imagination. But let me just recommend you read it and try to summarize what I found so helpful to my development of the third step of our plan. Using see, judge, act, we would expect judge to be the next step. But the work of Brueggemann, the witness of lives like Dorothy Day's, and my understanding of theological aesthetics point to something much larger. After we commit to the process out of love, and after we immerse ourselves in accompanying la realidad, we have to fully engage our imagination. For this, we have to use every tool available to us to focus on exactly what is wrong and how to write it. We need data. We need scripture. We need international laws and treaties. We need common sense. We need tradition and wisdom. But the role of each of these perspectives has to be to reveal God's imagination. We first do so negatively. We measure what we have seen against norms and ethics, finding the transgressions. But we can't stop there, because the norms and ethics, the ways we have interpreted our sacred scriptures and our tradition are limited by their context and circumstance. This is what Brueggemann calls the totality, a system that is so self-enclosed and self-confidence that it believes it knows all, foresees all, can judge all. But what if the system itself must be judged? How do we step beyond the totality of certainty and burst it open at the seams? This is when we need a robust imagination. One of the ancient Greeks pondered what it might be like to see our planet out from somewhere beyond it. He thought, if we could do this, we might react in a way that brings about peace among peoples because we will see ourselves in a new way. Science fiction has explored this idea countless times. If we see ourselves as earthlings all together on our small planet, Will we find solidarity? What do you think? We went to the moon, and rather than being humble by what we saw, we turned it into proof of American exceptionalism. We took that Archimedean vantage point and put it at the service of our political systems and commerce. We absorbed the whole Earth into our totality just as we, in this country, have the hubris to call ourselves Americans and this land America, regardless of the rest of the hemisphere's claim to that identity. <laughs> Totality works this way. It overcomes and controls. 
And today we're also aware that those at the service of the totality gaslight the rest of us. They make us question our judgments. They lie, obfuscate, misdirect, and use all kind of psychological manipulation. Because a chief goal of the totality is to render its critics powerless to bring about any change by denying space, authority, and voice. Our imagination must push past all that would stop us. We need to step beyond the boundaries of the totality and imagine the view from space, from outside imposed boundaries, from beyond the totality. We need to imagine God's view, God's will, God's purpose, and believe in the possibility that the way things are is neither necessary nor ordained. But it is limited by the totality built up by a patriarchy and economic systems fueled by selfishness. The step to imagine expansively brought Dorothy Day to create a radically different kind of community where the laws of the marketplace no longer existed. Expansive creativity brought Ignacio de Loyola to develop the spiritual exercises to unleash our imagination so we could accompany Christ as one of his friends. Imagination brought Pope John XXIII to acknowledge that the idea for the Second Vatican Council came to him completely unexpected, like a flash of heavenly light. I suggest to you that we are at an epoch-making inflection point for the survival of the global Catholic community that requires an ability to imagine, to move beyond the absurdity of having extraordinarily gifted people who, because they possess an X chromosome, are rendered powerless to lead and nurture our church communities. Judging the reality and finding it does not match God's expansive imagination gives birth to a project like Catholic Women Preach, <laughs> where through the gift of technology, women leaders offer freshly imagined perspectives on Sunday readings. Or a project like Homeboy Industries is born at a tiny parish wedged between several warring gangs in East Los Angeles because the Jesuit Greg Boyle imagined another possibility for the young people he was burying and their grieving families. Today, Homeboy is the largest gang prevention program in the world because like Father G says, nothing stops a bullet like a job. Each of us has to imagine past the boundaries, to persist even when we're gaslighted or told we are wrong, when we're called heretics or as male readers sometimes write to me, when we're told that women just need to stop complaining about lacking power in the church. Isn't that the definition of being a woman after all? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> And this takes me to step four of our plan, to act with power. Power is a difficult thing to untangle. We can see power from the perspective of Pontius Pilate, the capacity of one people, in this case the Romans, or one individual, Pilate, to impose their will on another people, in this case the Jewish people, or over another person, particularly Jesus. The power of the empire is the power to oppress, to decide who lives and who dies. This is the totality unchecked. Power can also be seen from the vantage point of those who are part of the official temple priesthood in Jerusalem. In this case, power is something we negotiate, which some of us want and seek and that in this case makes the officials of the temple betray their own people 
and conspire with the Romans. Here, power corrupts and creates alliances based on the duplicity of the one who has hoarded it. This type of power may also be seen from the negative, in the lack of power of the primitive church, witnessing the lives of the martyrs that ended violently. Power seen this way as a noun appears as an almost arbitrary eventuality. You are born Roman or Jew on this side of the border or on that one, male or female, and everything seems predetermined by these circumstances. In the case of the women of the church in the United States, this kind of power places us on the peripheries where our presence does not count and in a system that works hard to keep us there. But before we get too depressed, <laughs> I want to invite us to a different definition of power that appears in the Gospels, most especially in the stories of women. We remember the beautiful moment when a woman insists on anointing Jesus' feet and drying them with her hair. Or that other woman who, following him on the road, sick and shunned, tries to reach him and touch his garments. These women were so without power in their societies that their names were not preserved by the primitive church. Two women who were invisible beings, only as useful as sheep, but their stories were retold because of how typical these types of encounters with the most powerless were in Jesus' daily life. So to unpack the second meaning of power, I need Spanish. <laughs> in Spanish, power is poder, but it has two meanings. The first is just like in English as a noun, and the second is a verb shown in the actions of these two women. Because whether on the side of the road or in insisting on anointing Jesus, they pudieron, they acted, they pushed through. Here, poder becomes the verb of the ones on the margin. In the unforgettable slogan of the leaders of the United Farm Workers, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, Si se puede. Even though these women were persons completely on the margins of society, lacking every kind of power, economic, social, and religious, they were able to do what went against what the totality had dictated. Poder, as a verb, is defined by Chavez and Huerta and also by these nameless women of scripture as perseverance, guts, resolve which in the end requires fearlessness. We know that in the Gospels, the men criticized the courage of these women. They judged them, murmuring among themselves that they had transgressed. <laughs> the message is clear. She who has no poder, power as a noun and with the capital P of the powerful, should not have poder, not be able to do as a verb and with the lower case of the resolve of these women. Yet Jesus time and again showed his friends that the courage of these completely powerless women, who nevertheless pushed forward against every obstacle, was the example of the power to keep going, poder, for anyone who wants to be his disciple. On the cross, Jesus renounced completely the power with a capital P of the world. He is victim. He is sacrifice. But as the Christ, he redeems and gives primacy to the other meaning of power, poder. Because he is capable in his courage and fidelity to surrender his life out of love. In Jesus, Si se puede means being faithful to God, even unto death. The power 
poder with a capital P, of the world, enslaves and corrupts. The power of the world erects crosses and crucifies the vulnerable. The power of the world builds walls and persecutes the wretched. But the poder of the yes, of the resistance to evil, of fidelity and love and courage that will put its life on the line, that poder hangs on the cross, displaying the most complete freedom that, as John tells us, teaches us that poder is the willingness to give one's life for one's friends out of love. As a Latina Catholic living in this painful juncture in the life of the United States and the world, I am bleeding there on the side of the road. And just like my sister in scripture, my goal cannot be to simply know about Jesus from a distance, but to know him intimately. Following him closely, I come face to face with the question, can I touch your garment? Can I kiss your feet? Puedo. At this historical moment, I must confront the kind of power that tells me you can't do it. You are no one. Our objective as followers of Jesus must be his same objective to be able to announce, work for, enact, and long for everything required by God's love. Where we can, podemos, because we are someone and we are loved. Our actions will be different. They will answer to our particular circumstances, but they will be imbued with that power that flowed from Jesus as the woman touched his garment. We act in power because it is God who acts in history. And this takes me to our final step, but let's review the steps we have traced out so far. I'm such a teacher. Okay. <laughs> First, we ask why of ourselves discerning our call and our vocation. Second, we immerse ourselves in la realidad and by accompanying others in solidarity, try to see with the eyes of the powerless. Third, we engage our imaginations expansively using every possible tool we can to push us out past the edges of the totality of the comfortable, of the structures, out into the peripheries of what could be. And fourth, we find within ourselves the persistence and courage to act with power. And acting si se puede, we reach out for Jesus' tunic so it will be his power that will flow through us. And then finally, we ask the question, every day and of every situation toward what? This is the big metaphysical question, the question that takes us straight into Jesus' obsession, el reino de Dios. Asking this question helps us see that the church doesn't exist to perpetuate itself as an institution, but to make manifest the reign of God. In asking ourselves toward what is all this heading, toward what is all this oriented, we build then a corrective to making the goal of the work our survival as an institution. The process of discerning our commitment seeing la realidad, imagining ways to transform it, and then acting with courage has to always be pointed toward the reign of God. And doing so is not easy. So what are some of the characteristics of the reign? So we may check our GPS 
and see if we're heading the right way. First, many Christians confuse the kingdom of God with the afterlife, thinking that it is about their eventual entry into St. Peter's heavily guarded pearly gates. We know it is not about that. In Jesus' telling, the reign of God has already begun. He knows it surrounds him and becomes stronger with every act of love, reconciliation, and healing. The rain comes alive as he shares the table but with those no one wants. It flows like a river as he feeds the hungry with his friends. It shines like a light as he accompanies the sick in their pain and lifts them out of it. The scriptures are clear. The rain is about now, a persistent now that bubbles up within human history, when we listen to the Spirit's promptings. Second, this orientation toward the reino is communal. There is no ambiguity whatsoever in Jesus' teaching that would allow us to think that we reach the reign by looking out for ourselves. The reign happens to and with and us that always links love of neighbor with love of God, and that asks precisely for our work to always be on behalf of the other. We are to feed, clothe, visit, heal, teach, and like the many debates Jesus had with those who cared only about their own righteousness, we are to overturn the tables of structures that make the widows poor and leave the orphans and strangers without protection. God is the one who has imagined the rain into being, and it encompasses everything. And without the presence of the poor and the meek, who are God's most beloved, it simply cannot exist. It is precisely in radical inclusivity and abiding love that the rain shines the brightest, calling us to it. Finally, the reign of God is intensely fragile, which is why orienting ourselves always toward it is a difficult daily exercise. There's not much guesswork to what the anti-rain looks like. It is individualistic. It uses power to oppress and judge. It is idolatrous and replaces the love of God with the love of things. It dehumanizes others so it may dismiss their rightful demands. It commodifies the water, the earth, our fellow creatures, our planet. The anti-rain puts a dollar sign on everything and claims to have happiness for sale. The forces of the anti-rain are strong. And to recognize them and do battle with them, we need to make the effort to hold in memory every single instance when the rain has opened up before us and we have recognized it. Our plan is circular then, because it begins once more with the awareness of the effulgence of God's reign as it shines and enters us to feed and nurture our resolve. We know why this matter, because building God's reign every single day, like we're doing right now and right here, really matters. We accompany la realidad and are clear out, clear eyed about its beauty and its heartbreak. We imagine new ways, new paths to the rain, and we act with power to help the beauty of the rain break into la realidad more fully. And when we do, we hold within us once again that treasured moment when the reino showed itself and nurturing our resolve, we begin again. So may every moment of our lives be spent in this work 
of stunning beauty. And may we do it boldly as part of the eruption of women into history because this glorious and wounded church is hashtag mine too. <laughs>